And welcome back, George Norrie, Jeffrey Jarrett, back with us, intuitive medium, published author, spiritual artist, spiritual educator. In his passion to write and teach about universal consciousness and the rediscovery of the higher self and the continuity of life. As an educator, Jeff provides spiritual workshops and mentorships on self-communication, intuition development, channeling higher self, chakra balancing and healing, and karma and reincarnation, and of course, manifestation. That's one of my favorite words, Jeff. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. How easy is it to manifest things? Manifest is the easiest thing we can do because you're using your mind, body, and soul. You're using your talent, skills, and your passions. And and manifestation is a process of just um, being yourself. And that's why it's so different from so many things. And that's been such a hot topic the last several months. Explain what an intuitive medium is. So an intuitive medium has the ability to connect. The the intuitive part is connecting with your over self, your higher self, and that's the voice of your spirit. So it's getting guidance and wisdom and understanding from your spirit, which has existed forever. The mediumship part has to do with connecting with spirits, um, loved ones who've crossed over and both vibrate at a higher frequency. So it's, it's all about just connecting to that higher energy. Is it easy or difficult, Jeff, to connect with spirits that have passed on? You know, it's, it's just like anything that we do, playing the piano, um, you know, learning how to do any task, skill, or talent. The more that you do it, the easier it does get. It's just making your mind available and open. It's being in a place of stillness and calm and allowing those subtle uh, messages to, to just be received. Would you consider yourself like a radio? Absolutely. You're a receiver, and you're tuning into a higher frequency as opposed to a lower frequency. So when we're in the physical world, we're used to, we can see, feel, hear, taste, and touch within very limited ranges. But when you can expand that range, you, you can understand things from the subtle your subtle body, which is your energy field, out even up to the highest vibration of spirit. You balance science and religion. Is that difficult for you? No, because they really, truth reinforces itself in so many different ways. I was raised Catholic, and the teachings of Christ are very interesting, you know, when it comes to the resurrection and so forth. And I see a lot of symbolism. But even when we go way back um, to Eastern philosophy and reincarnation and the continuity of life. And you get into philosophers like Socrates and Plato Plato from, you know, 400 B.C., who back then believed that mind is separate from the body and that the, the mind continues after the body dies. Jeff, when you communicate with spirit, how do you know you're communicating with the one you're trying to find? So spirit will provide subtle clues. So the sitter, the person receiving the the information, has what I call connecting points with that spirit. They're unique experiences they had. It might have been a vacation, a holiday, a gift exchange, a certain music or a style of music, Um, but they have really specific um, hobbies, passions that that were shared between those two, and that's the door opener. It, It opens a door to say, hey, I have the spirit here, and this is how they've connected with you. And then from there, they'll prevent, uh, they'll provide uh, inspirational information. And that's my favorite part of the reading is what insight do they have from that higher perspective now that they're out of body? Do you demand evidence? Yeah, I, when I'm sitting with spirit, I ask them to just please allow me uh, to understand uh, their connection uh, to the to the sitter, and there's a process they call it blending, and you blend with the energy of the spirit. They know what's unique to you, too. So, you know, if I know tennis, they're going to use tennis analogies versus football. They, they know how to make that connection, and then they, then you blend with your, your sitter, and you get, I, I'm empathic. I can feel what the sitter wants to know and understand, and spirit then will relay that. And like you said earlier, the, the radio or the telephone in between, I relay the, the information between the two 
uh, loved ones. How did this happen for you, Jeff? So as early as I can remember, I remember being in my crib and seeing and talking to spirits. And these spirits coached me and, and told me that I was going to have the ability to help people understand um, that their loved ones are always around them. And I remember my first uh, experience seeing a spirit. It was a, I was three, and a neighbor across the street had passed away. He was reading the paper in his chair. And when they were carrying him out on the stretcher, I saw a likeness of him standing next to it. And he was just smiling, and he just said, everything's okay, everything's okay. So it's, it's been natural for me to have that. So, you know, some people have that natural ability, and then others can develop it through practice. Let's talk a little more about these connecting points that you are so tuned in with. Yes, yeah, so the connecting points are really emotional um, connections that you have with a loved one, really special moments. It's not always that trip to Disney. It might be that conversation you had sitting on the porch while you're you know, watching the stars. It might be uh, a concert you shared. It might be a hobby it might be a recipe someone shared or how to work with a garden. But those deeply uh, connected um, actions, words, experiences are, are embedded in you. And there's a principle in science called entanglement, and it really is connected to the, that entanglement. On a molecular level, cellular level, or even an organ level, there's a history, energetic history, with molecules, cells, and tissues, and we've heard stories where people get organ transplants and all of a sudden they'll feel personality traits or they'll have dreams or they'll, they'll have, want to make food choices that are, were connected to the, the donor because there's, there's an energy entanglement there. Imagine though, the entanglement that exists between you and another person that you shared your life with. It's an eternal, everlasting uh, energy exchange that will continue beyond the, the physical incarnation. Jeffrey, is this entanglement critical for the relationship between it, this, it this side and it, the other side? What, what I believe is so important for us while we're here, when we incarnate, we come with a very specific uh, soul agreement. And that soul agreement, we're going to be led on according to the personality. We, we choose our body, which has a personality. But there are two major feedback mechanisms that are going to help us understand and know that we're on the right path. One really important one are relationships because you attract to you that like energy of what you're putting out. So the people that come to you are a reflection. They're a mirror to, to how you're expressing yourself. And if you don't like what you're getting, then that might be a clue for you to do some work to change that. But when you really love and embrace and have compassion for a person, you're seeing a part of yourself uh, that's your true self. The, the second mechanism is karma. And karma can be instant or it, it can take time. But I think in science we always talk about feedback loops. And karma and relationships are really important feedback loops as we're, we're here experiencing life. And letting us know are we on the right path or do we have to make some adjustments. Is it us who wants to deal with the departed or the departed that wants to deal with us? That's a great question, and it's a symbiotic relationship. One thing I've learned in the last 10 years with spirit communication is how important it is for them to follow us and to watch us. It's like watching reality TV. If they had struggles with patience, with forgiveness, um, some life lesson, they can watch us and they can learn by seeing the experiences that, that we're incurring. And so there's a, a win-win. They give us little nudges of encouragement and um, try to keep us on the path. You know, they don't in interfere with our free will. But when we're making a choice that doesn't seem like it, it's in our higher good, they'll send a message through a dream, through another person, through a song on the radio, through a billboard when you're driving by. It's they're, they're very masterful at getting messages to us. It's all about us just being aware and open to receive. Jeff, explain what the spirit world is like. So there, there's a couple different interpretations. Um, one that I love from uh, classical uh, 
medium uh, way back in the 1800s is they call it Summerland. It's like a vacation area. It's it's lighter. It's it's grander. It's there's more compassion and love and kindness. And in that world, what we do is we have lots of reunions. Again, we meet people we knew in this life or even our ancestors before because there's a thread within a soul family. But we're meeting those individuals that that were living a similar, uh, perhaps a, a similar life path. Um, and the other thing is they do a lot of reflection. Like, like we, we're encouraged to do here, you know, meditation, journal, and so forth. But they reflect on what life choices they made, and they can see that if they change that choice, how it ch- would change the whole trajectory of their life. It's not in a judgmental way. It's more in a, a healing and understanding way. Uh, as they observe, there's a, a self-evaluation, and then they can start to prepare for their next incarnation. Are they sad because they have passed over? No, and you know, George, that's one of the big disappointments, I think, sometimes when I talk to people. is, How come they're not sad? They're not sad because they have the awareness and understanding that they're still connected. There's no division. The veil's real thin between the, wo- the worlds. And it, sometimes it dis- uh, they get a little disappointed when people are in such deep grief. They understand the physical connection's gone, but when you really sit with it, the physical is so minor compared to the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual connection and bond you have with someone. And you know there's no distance there. They make themselves known, and they like to use really unique signs and symbols. And it can be something as simple as pennies, feathers, hummingbirds, you know, roses, a certain song. But they, they'll let you know they're there, but you have to be in that mindset and give yourself that, that stillness and quiet time to feel their presence. Because most, most spirit contact is feeling-based. Is the process of death different for different kinds of ways they've died? Let me explain that. Somebody dies in a car crash. Somebody dies in their sleep. Somebody dies in a hospital room. Is the transition to the other side different for each one, or is it all the same? You know, and again, another great question to think about. So. What is interesting is many times when people want that evidence, can you tell me specifically, you know, what was I wearing when I was, you know, by their deathbed or what was going on? They're not so um, focused on that. And if you think about it, they're going to just this amazing uh, place, uh, heaven, nirvana, the afterlife. And if you, you're heading, you're, you imagine you're, you're looking toward the sun and not back at the dark, they're not so connected to that process. Now, just like we resist in this life, there are people who will resist. Their, their spirit will resist leaving the body or their, their personality, their ego will hold on to it. And that resistance you know, can make it more painful, but as soon as they leave, they realize it's all pain-free. It's all gone. There's no more emotions. There's no more fear. There's no more shame. There's no more guilt. I mean, how, what a beautiful place. That's why when people talk about, you know, having a near-death experience, many of them will say how they didn't want to come back because it's just um, beautiful. And that's what the spirit world has, has conveyed to me. So it's once they let go, and many times they don't let go because they're concerned for loved ones here. They, they might be concerned for their well-being and, um, but that's why it's so important that when we have the opportunity, if someone's making their transition, that we, we send them off. We say, you know, do whatever in your highest good and allow them to, to float away so that they are not in that place of resistance. Is astral projection a little like dying? In a way, with astral projection, just a, a part of your spirit is going traveling. So when you look at your energy body, your, your energy field, you know, your, your physical body is actually part of the energy field. Then you have your emotions, your mental, your, your spiritual. Um, but your, the way I see your astral, astral projection is you're taking a piece of your spirit and 
it's a pioneer. It's going to go to a different dimension. It's going to go to a different location. It's going to go to a different time so that you can explore and then bring that back to the spirit uh, to assimilate that experience. There might be some unresolved um, things. And this is what's interesting about Carl Jung and Rudolf Steiner's work as psychologists is they believe that your spirit could actually do a lot of uh, growth from, from just projecting yourself uh, to different lifetimes or different dimensions. And you could have that experience, you can resolve that conflict and then bring it back to, to yourself. And we often travel astrally in our sleep state and when we get into that really deep REM sleep is when we have the opportunity to um, expand beyond all the dimensions. You know, the only place that time and space exists is in the physical. Once you leave the physical realm, which you do when you go into the astral plane, you have so many limitless possibilities to, to explore yourself. Jeffrey, give us a tutorial on dying for somebody who's just passed on, what do they expect? So what, what spirit tells me happens immediately is that they'll often use the analogy of a train station. And they'll, you know, they, they go through the tunnel that people talk about, but they end up, and all these loved ones are, are there to meet them. And there's a knowing and understanding, even of ones you've never met in this physical lifetime. But there's this overwhelming unity and oneness that happens energetically. And it's not that they forget about us on this side, but they're, they're focused on this, this amazing experience. But they also realize how limited their spirit is in the physical body. It's like being, having an anchor attached. And now they're like this free-floating helium balloon, and they have this ability to just float and fly and and again, that, that sense of resistance, that heaviness, that's what many people talk about again after a near-death experience is the heaviness they feel once they come back into the body. So they, they explore these relationships because remember our relationships with going back to our term entanglement, we're entangled with all these different individuals. We have experiences that are unique to us. And those individuals will remind us of those and immediately we go into that that place of self-reflection. There, there are studies, too, that uh, people have done with through hypnosis and, and um, regression, and they say that, like, if someone was really, really ill, sometimes their spirit needs to recharge a little bit before it has all these experiences of networking and reconnecting and, and actually, like, celebrating uh, when they're, you know, they're meeting each other. When someone chooses to leave their body, too, it's not just about their karma and their time. There's a divine and sacred timing universally within the family, especially the soul family, of when they leave. So if a spirit leaves before someone, you know, a loved one gets to the hospital, there might be an issue that that, that loved one has to deal with relative to guilt or shame or whatever. But it's not any kind of punishment, but it's, it's, a, it's a lesson. But when we get into that space of knowing and understanding that everything's in divine and perfect order, um, that's the knowing that our loved ones get to immediately when they leave their body. And that's why it's just, it seems like it's just magnificent what they get to experience. Jeffrey, when we come back in just a moment here on Coast to Coast, we'll talk a little bit about reincarnation and get your thoughts on that. Jeffrey Jowett, our special guest, his website is his name. Linked up at coasttocoastam.com. And we're back with Jeffrey Dredd as we talk about the spirit world. Jeff, what are your thoughts on reincarnation? So reincarnation is a great opportunity for the expansion and, and higher understanding of our ourselves because we get the opportunity to experience life from many different dimensions. You know, male, female, rich, poor, different cultures, different economics. Uh, statuses and so forth. So it's, it's the opportunity to get to know yourself and, and find your way back home. And my, my belief is that our soul is the essence of our true self, and it's just a piece of our soul incarnates, and it chooses a, a costume like we do for Halloween, 
and that costume has a unique personality that makes it likely for us when we come here to go and understand some karmic uh, event that, that, that we're born with. It's called ripe seed karma, karma that was created from a past life. And we work through that, letting go of that karma, and then when we're, we're done with that lifetime, we uh, re reconnect with the soul, bring that insight back, and then a different aspect of us will reincarnate again. So it's not the same exact spirit that comes back. It's, it's an aspect of it, but it has the knowing and understanding or has the ability to, to know and understand when you get into the really deep uh, meditation. Why do some spirits reincarnate a lot and others don't? So a lot of it just has to do with not just the individual soul and its evolution, but the family of souls it belongs to, because the it, it's all for one and all. We're all in this together. We're all for one and one for all. What you three learn musketeers. From, <laughs> you, yeah, you. What you learn and grow from, your soul family members do, and what they learn from and understand, they bring to your group too. So. I, I really like to see it, you know, my, my background is molecular biology and, and uh, anatomy. And when you look at the body, each cell in the body has all the same information, um, and, but some of them manifest into different things. Some are muscle fibers that can contract. Some are blood cells that can transport, you know, oxygen and CO2. They have different functions, but they all contribute to the overall well-being of the organism and your soul family you're an, an aspect of it and you have the opportunity to to do all these different things but you're you're helping for the betterment of all and that's why there's a natural pull a lot of your guests will talk about this enlightenment that's happening um, there's a natural evolution toward enlightenment and understanding as we learn and grow and learn and grow, um, we, we move forward higher, and we, we soon will no longer need the physical plane. They talk about all these different planes of existence, and uh, the physical is one of the lower ones. So once we evolve, once we get all the lessons we need to, and, our, and we help our soul family members do, then we can be in the higher planes of existence. It's no question that uh, this is somewhat magical, isn't it? It's, it is just incredible when you think about yourself and how big you are. I remember when I was little, my dad would take me for a Sunday night walk, look up into the heavens, see the stars, and just start to wonder and ask all those why, why, why. But knowing and understanding how expansive we are, you know, at the very least, your consciousness is, in this lifetime, is as big as many years as you've been in, in if you think about thought traveling like the speed of light, if you're 40 years old, you know, you're 40 light years. I mean, it's huge how big you are um, energetically. And that's why I think it's so important, this mindful movement we've been through that we're, we're heading into stronger and stronger, is that being mindful of what you think, what you say, what you do, because that energy is going out and it's forever expanding. And it's you're contributing to your family, the family's contributing to the community, the community to your country, and, the, and then the world, and then the universe. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're all interconnected because, again, that, that concept of entanglement. What books are you working on now, Jeff? There's a couple I'm exploring. One is on consciousness. There's been so much done on consciousness, but I want to help people understand how to use their consciousness to really the, the idea of manifestation that we talked about earlier in the show. And to me, it's so important in, in understanding. I took a part-time high school teaching job, and my one class I teach is wellness and well-being. And I teach those kids who are at that, they're juniors and seniors, and they're ready to make those choices about what career paths and what if they want to go on to university or go on to a vocational school or just start their own business but helping them understand how to manifest using their mind, body, and, and spirit to do it. And, it's, and, and there's just so many great things we do. We reprogram ourselves with affirmations. We remember what we're grateful for. So using the, the idea of uh, 
gracefulness, and then visualization. Your, your brain, you know, has an area that is a filter that determines what you perceive, and it's called the reticulating activation system. And when you program for that whatever you're manifesting, your, your mind will point out all the things that are in your path that complement that. And so that shows how powerful you are at driving that force, that intention of creating and manifesting. So I really want to, I want to explore that a little bit more, but I also want to explore writing a novel. I haven't done a novel yet. And I thought about using myself as a character in the whole process of enlightenment and what I learned through religion and science and how it really made me more uh, embracing and understanding the whole metaphysical world, that it, they don't compete, they complement. What do you prefer, being psychically inclined or mediumship? So actually, I, I, I love both, but I love the intuitive part. And James Von Prague, a very well-known medium, yes. it dubbed me early on as an intuitive medium because I love to help people understand what their soul path is, what karma they're working through, and when we link with the spirit world, what was the um, commonality in, in that soul family, that soul group, and soul mates, and what lessons are learned together, that's my, my really most favorite of all. The psychic stuff's nice, but what I encourage people is don't let someone else make choices for you. And a psychic, you know, you feel into the energy of a situation, and you can help give people guidance, but you have to make sure you leave them with the choice of what feels right for them, but what things they can watch out for that might turn into being resistors or obstacles, uh, preventing them from achieving what they, they come here to do. But I'm really, I really like to focus on helping people understand what they're here to do, what karma they're letting go of, and what would be in their highest good. How did you enhance your abilities, Jeff? You know, it's just been such a lifelong process, but I think my greatest teacher has always been nature. I love to hike. Um, I like to spend alone time in nature and just feel the connection. Uh, and, and then I think in the last couple years, the greatest tool I've had, too, is my manifestation journal. The way I see a, a manifestation journal is I write down three or four things on that day. This is where I'm putting my energy. I have never did a journaling. I, I, I never kept a journal more than a week. And now I've, I've kept one for about two years now. And, it, and I look forward to it because I, I say to myself, okay, like I'm going to focus on, you know, my emotional balance. I'm going to focus on understanding the process of manifestation. I'm going to focus on understanding how the spirit world can assist in certain family matters. But when I set the intention, I'm saying to the universe, hey, I'm open to receive insight here. And then it's just listening. You know, all day long, it's so important to take two minutes, three minutes to just sit back and listen. What, what was presented to you? What was given to you? And because it's all there. The same thing when I teach classes on mediumship. I love to teach mediumship from the perspective of I take a person and they create a whole series of connecting points. And their final project in the class is they make a, you know how people do dream boards or manifestation mm -hmm. boards? They do a, a, a connecting points board with that loved one. So, oh, we love to get French fries at McDonald's. We always like to listen to, you know, James Dean. We, that, they'll make a whole chart of it. And then it's, it's a visual instant connection to them. Uh, to, to find and feel and understand that that's there. It's always there. It's never going to go away. In your work, Jeff, do you ever come across demons? You know, I don't. And I think, you know, like attracts like. And there's times when I'm reading for someone that uh, a loved one comes through that has a lower energy, but not malicious. It might be you know, someone who just carried a lot of shame and guilt for maybe how they left or, or how they treated someone here. That's the lowest vibration I go is that shame, that guilt. But I haven't ever personally experienced 
anything lower than that, and I just think that it's just not on my radar. Have you been lucky? Lucky, but also I think it's just how you program yourself to receive. Again, when I go back to that idea of the reticulating activation system in your brain, it is the filter for where your attention is and what you draw to you. And, you know, technology uses this, whether you use Google or um, Yahoo or Instagram or Facebook, when you do a search, all of a sudden, like if I'm searching running shoes, all of a sudden all this running stuff will show up. Oh, here's a great, here are great running trails. Go on a vacation here, there's running. Here are great stocks for running. And that's how your, your brain works, is when you program it to, and, and that's to me the principle of manifestation. You're programming yourself to receive and, and visualizing yourself receiving you, your attention is to things all around that area that you send out. And in, when, I, when I do my spiritual work, I, I work toward the higher, the, the higher vibration. And the, the lower stuff's off my radar. You know, earlier, early in the program when you talked about it being like a medium being like a radio, you know, I'm not tuned in to 94.5. I'm tuned into 106.7 or whatever the higher numbers are. So it's, it's not on my radar. Since you've been doing this, and you've been doing this a very long time, what has been the most satisfying thing you've done? To me, the, the, really the most satisfying thing is to feel a shift in a person when I give them a message and they know their loved one is still with them, especially a parent who's lost a child or someone who's lost a partner when they're in that deep, deep grief and that shame and that guilt, I should have done this, I should have done that. Yeah. You know, anytime we go out of the present moment focus, that's when we get into fear. And if I can shine a little light be, to be the, uh, just the messenger that, that shines the light to help a person shift out of that a little bit, so satisfying. Because I know it just doesn't impact them, and it impacts everyone they're connected to. You wrote a book back in 2009 called Hope for Parents Who Have Lost Children. That's got to be difficult. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, the, the, the premise of that book, how it was presented to me when I was in grad school, I say my hardest lesson in, in grad school wasn't the molecular biology experiments I was doing. It was the community service we did at school. And, and I was at Roswell Cancer Institute, and I chose to work with uh, terminally ill uh, children. And I worked with this one girl, Elizabeth, and met with her just several times. We played board games, but she told me the last time I met her that I would be a messenger to help parents understand when their children crossed. And so I was guided to write that book first of all my books because they want, they want parents to understand this divine and internal link and to also understand the whole idea that your parents are your parents, but they bring your life force here to the earth plane. But ultimately, they don't belong to you. They have their own path and journey. And when a spirit leaves, whether they're you know two months old, two years old, 20 years old, there's a beautiful lesson to be learned. And it usually has to do a lot with trusting and believing in love beyond the boundaries of the physical. And there are huge lessons for a parent or a loved one to learn but I truly believe that those lessons are only presented to people who are capable to really, truly heal from them and grow from them. Next hour, Jeff will take your calls. He will give you a psychic reading about yourself, a question you'll have to ask him, or also a mediumship reading of someone who has departed, and he'll just need some names from you and uh, specific questions when we come back. <laughs> 